we're together today to talk about kind of what Perkins is going to look like as we go into 2023 and beyond. And it's kind of weird to be thinking about this because some of you haven't even submitted your application yet for 22-23, and we're already leaping ahead into the future years. But as you know, I'm sure there is this whole big change, this wave coming where we're doing the aligning for student success, the integrated guidance and application process that will impact all of us. And so we just wanted to make sure that we also got out there early to talk about how the Perkins grant process is going to work alongside of what's happening with the integrated application. So this session is really specifically focused toward secondary direct grant recipients of Perkins. We had a, a session yesterday for post-secondary direct and tomorrow we'll do one for regional coordinators and then there's some office hours next week for people that want to talk more about it. And of course, you guys can get a hold of me anytime um, that you, you know, would like to have a conversation. So with that, um, just a friendly reminder, and I don't know if you uh, were able to watch the video that uh, I recorded last week or the week before. Some of this is going to be repeat, and I apologize if you can hear the guy leaf blowing across the street. Of course, that happens right now. Um, but I'm going to have a few of the slides that are the same, but I really have teased it out so that it's real specific to what's going to happen for you as a direct grant recipient. So um, just a friendly reminder, when Perkins 5 came along, there were a few changes that were part of that Perkins 5 implementation. One of the things was the requirement for a needs assessment every two years. That was something we hadn't had uh, to do in the prior years with Perkins. It required engagement with our community. Uh, much more broadly than we had been used to. So we had been talking to our business partners, our advisory committees, but um, there is a whole long list of people and partners that we need to consult during the needs assessment process as part of Perkins 5. Developing a four-year plan and then the opportunity to update that plan every two years is needed. And Believe it or not, this really works nicely into the rhythms of the integrated application. Um, so it was kind of a good fit. Moving into 23 to 27 and beyond, um, as you know, we've got the Aligning for Student Success initiative that's working to align these six programs that are currently housed in ODE. And it's really a look at um, really, I think, a good look at trying to start integrating um, our ideas and our improvement efforts so that we're looking across the whole K-12 and beyond spectrum. Um, and you can see, I'm sure you've been a part of the presentations that have gone through this chart, but um, the thinking was that the core elements or the common elements across the six programs and the goals were very nicely aligned. So here we are. Moving into um, the integrated application process, one of the really cool things is it brings CTE into the conversation, uh, into the whole in a, or overall kind of part of the K-12 landscape when talking about improvement efforts. It's no longer that thing out there doing their own thing um, as it is in some places. I know in some places it is an integral part of the K-12 program. In some places, though, it has still remained kind of separate. So this is an opportunity for us to sit smack dab at the table um, with the, the important people, right? It also provides, and uh, there's a link to this PowerPoint in the chat. And um, so you should be able to have that and you don't need to take notes. It's also an opportunity for us to talk to new audiences. So in the past, we've kind of talked to our same old partners, right? Our advisory committees, our local business and industry, our WIBs, our workforce investment boards, our community college instructors. But this really gives us a chance to be talking to other people now, um, you know, people that are really interested in band and having the arts and people that um, really have an interest in elementary literacy initiatives. So really having the opportunity to sit down together and learn from each other about what's important in that K-12 landscape. One of the things about the uh, aligned application is that it's gonna continue the work that you're already doing. 
But as you know, there's a significant adjustment to the rhythm and the timeline of what you would typically do with Perkins. And the whole effort is looking for opportunities for efficiencies and, and redundancies. And so um, we don't keep submitting the same information over and over again and consulting with the same people over and over again about different initiatives. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts about like what the Perkins application looks like. What does this mean for you? And so, uh, as you know, every Perkins recipient must conduct a needs assessment and the recipients must ensure that um, you address the required questions that are spelled out in the Perkins law and that you engage those people that we talked about. So it doesn't matter how you receive your money, everybody that touches Perkins needs to do these two things. And we're also, we have asked this in the past, but we're gonna to continue to ask it now that you share the results of your needs assessment with the CTE regional coordinator so that they have the opportunity to synthesize uh, the information that you find into the regional uh, reserve grant or application. Hey, Hal, good to see you. I'm gonna drop the slides into the uh, chat so you can follow along if you'd like. Thank you, Donna. Mm -hmm. So those are the requirements for every Perkins recipient. As a direct uh, grant recipient, you will conduct your needs assessment as part of the overall district initiative. There's a tool that's been provided in the integrated guidance and districts have the opportunity to use that tool that's been provided, or they can use a different assessment tool as long as they make sure that they ask all the right questions, like all the right questions are discussed during that needs assessment, and they include the required partners. And one of the concerns that came up early on was that perhaps um, the needs assessment didn't have all of those Perkins requirements in it, the one that's in the integrated guidance. And so I've done a crosswalk and it's available here and it shows you, oh, that's not what we were looking for. And it shows you here that these are the requirements for the, the things to be addressed in the needs assessment. And here's where you will find it um, in the integrated application. So I've done that work so that if you feel the need to pull that out or to have that information, you'll know kind of where, where it's located. And I was really getting excited. I was color coding everything in case I needed to sort it. <laughs> and I wanted to make sure that I could keep it together. So that's all that the color coding was about was, you know, everything that's green has to do with the well-rounded education um, portion of that. Um, just as a reminder, these are the required community partners. If you look at the long list, I had a, a number of 17 before. There's like 17 actually called out in the law, but this is kind of smooshed together. So CTE educators that are secondary and post-secondary are smooshed, but they call out like, um, you know, college advisors, college deans, um, high school educators, uh, your counselors, administrators, your workforce development board, business and industry, parents and students, representative of focal students, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, representatives of your local and regional, or excuse me, local or regional agencies that serve um, out of school youth, homeless children and youth, and at risk youth, representatives of your tribal community, and then any other people that the LEA requires. So that's kind of it around the needs assessment and the engagement part. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and keep talking for a minute and give you a chance to answer questions in just one second, if that's okay. We're gonna talk about the application and budget process real quick. So some of the things that are the same from what you're used to is you're gonna use the needs assessment results to develop a four-year plan. You're gonna identify outcome strategies and activities. It's just a language change. It used to be benchmarks and goals or goals and benchmarks or something like that in the old application. We're gonna change our language to be outcome strategies and activities. And you're still gonna to have to answer the required questions that Perkins lays out that have to be addressed in the application. And again, guess what? I did a crosswalk. 
and hopefully it's linked here. Oh, look, it is. So I went through and these are the required questions. And Good morning, group four. This is Hello. Hello. Um, these are the required questions on the left and then where in the integrated guidance you'll find that as far as that draft application, the sample application goes, these are the questions that show up that are specific to answering our Perkins required questions. Some things that are different are uh, the submission process. Um, this doesn't apply, you're all direct. Uh, grant recipients as far as secondary goes, but we've gone through a variety of iterations of submission, right? So we used to have like these paper submissions, right? Back in the day and- General um, service administration contract on the phone. I think it's about like the ability to do card. Boom. Um, so we used to do a paper submission, then we went to SM Apply. This year we had a Google doc and we're moving to a Smartsheet dashboard where it will look very much, well, you'll be uh, in the uh, integrated guidance, the whole aligned application, all six of the programs will show up. The entire integrated piece will show up in this dashboard and you'll be submitting your application through that. Um, you'll be submitting a two-year application as part of the integrated application process now, typically in Perkins, even though it was like a four-year plan or a two-year update, each year you were going through and you were updating your goals and activities and your budget. Now you're going to be submitting a plan that has a two year set of goals and funding that goes with those. And then, so like after you do that first submission, the next year you don't have to go in and do that whole piece. But instead what you'll need to do is quarterly progress reporting. So how are you doing on those goals? How are you doing on your budget? What kinds of adjustments need to be made? Um, so it's more of like a in time, just in time, instead of having to look back and remember what had happened. In the budget area, there's kind of some big changes for us that have been doing Perkins budgeting for a while. Um, one is this two-year budget, right? You're going to be looking at time, you know, what your needs are fiscally over two years. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is use 85% of your 22-23 allocation for planning purposes. And then as the actual amounts get uh, released, you'll be able to adjust those in that dashboard we were just talking about. So that's what we're going to have you plan using. One of the cool things uh, in the integrated application budget template is that a majority of your funds need to be allocated there, but not all of them. So for the first year, you might have a few, uh, you know, some dollars that are unallocated, kind of waiting to see how things go. And that's going to be okay. In the past, we've had to budget down to the penny. And then the coolest thing that I love is this idea of tiered budgeting, which allows you to kind of get those next up items or activities identified, talked about through your uh, leadership team as you're developing your strategies. Um, your activities, strategies, activities, um, you can kind of be talking about like, if this doesn't work out, what else could we do to uh, meet that outcome? So it allows you to kind of get prior approval so that you can substitute things in without having to go back to ODE for approval for each and every item. And again, the quarterly reports. Um, some of the same things that you uh, are used to is your budget needs to be aligned to what you found out in your needs assessment and what's in your application, your outcomes, goals, and strategies. I'm sorry, your outcomes, strategies, and activities. And then the allowability of the use of funds remains unchanged. Um, as I said, uh, the peer, the, excuse me, the tiered budgeting uh, allows you for those up next type activities during that initial discussion period, it really allows you for those shifting things that happen, whether that's you know an implementation roadblock or some roadblocks that were removed and you're able to move more quickly than you had planned. Uh, we know that there have been a lot of uh, issues around ordering, procurement, uh, receiving goods, as well as personnel. So the idea behind this is to kind of have that tentative next steps in your budget already approved 
so that you don't have to go in and, and do all of those change processes. A little bit more about the application and budget. Uh, your Perkins application is totally embedded in your district application. The cool thing is, is it ensures again that we're part of the overall improvement strategy in your district. Um, the integrated application and budget does require board approval and submission in March of 2023. So that causes your rhythms to speed up. And your CTE regional coordinator will need to have a copy just like with the needs assessment so they can synthesize kind of the regional activities, the regional needs and priorities into those reserve grants. So I'm gonna stop for just a second and see if there's some questions at the moment. Okay. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions at the moment. I'll go ahead and continue on and offer you some ideas for how to prepare for the change that's coming. Donna, can I ask a quick mm -hmm. question? Where is our current uh, Perkins action plan located so that we might comment on our progress? So the one that I'm talking about is is for the future, right? It won't be right. submitted until next March. And then it will come up in smart sheets on a dashboard that your district will access. Is and for our current one, the one that we're we're supposed to be reflecting on as we close out this year. Right. That one is located where? It was uh, submitted in SM Apply. And if you contact uh, Barb or Melinda, I'm pretty sure they have copies of them that they could send to you. Okay. Yeah, you should have gotten a folder um, from Barb that had all of your stuff, um, a Google Drive folder, and then that okay. way you just go in. They made templates and made it pretty easy. Thank you. Barb's giving you the thumbs up. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so reach out if you have any problems, Hal. Thank you, Barb. <laughs> you bet. And thanks, Kelly. All right, so back to the screen share. Maybe. There we go. So kind of thinking about some things to help you think about getting prepared for the change. Um, one of the shifts that we have made is a shift in language from using the Perkins language of special populations. That's what's in our legislation. That's the language that you'll see in our federal reports. We've shifted that to using the term focal student groups. And that aligns with the other five initiatives that we're working with, and it aligns with Oregon's vision for how we serve our students. And so you'll see on this slide the listing of focal students according to um, the, the rules and statute at ODE. So students of color, students with disability, LGBTQ2 SIA plus students, emerging bilingual, uh, students navigating poverty, homeless and foster care, migrant students, or, excuse me, recent arrivers, incarcerated youth and adults, and others who have historically experienced disparities in our school. The bold ones are kind of like specifically named in Perkins, but I also wanted to do a little crosswalk to make sure that we captured all of the special pops, and I had questions about that um, as I've been talking to some of you. So in addition to the Perkins definition, you'll see here that focal students group calls out a variety of student groups and names them. And then a, a place where we kind of hide some of our historically <laughs> named special pops, um, we're going to capture under historically experienced disparities. So our non-trad students, and for those of you who may be newer to Perkins, Non-trad is non-traditional by gender. So careers and uh, occupations that are typically female dominated would be non-traditional for a male student. So we're looking at evening out the gender gaps around some of those uh, careers. Single parents and pregnant uh, individuals, 
out of workforce individuals. And then we also have a call out for parents or members of armed forces, uh, specifically in Perkins. So now we're using focal student groups. These are the groups that you'll, we're using the term focal student groups. These are the things that you will see when you look at focal student groups, but please remember in your back pocket that we're also talking about these four um, bullets that we've kind of lumped together. Wanted to specifically say that out loud. The 12 step process for planning, I'm sure you've seen this document, but I wanted to kind of go back to it because it really, it really tells a lot in a very simple picture. So here we are, we're in step one and two. We're preparing materials. We're starting to plan, think about who needs to be involved. Um, in the fall then, we're gonna start engaging our students, staff and community. Then as we move from the fall into like late fall, start working on that needs assessment and reviewing. Then in January, February, really start working on that plan, strategies, checking back, making sure that you know, you're getting it right, you've listened to your, uh, your partners, um, you're gathering activities, you're developing your budget, you're writing your plan, you're checking it, and woo, look, you turn it in in March. And so all of this stuff is gonna happen at a much more rapid pace than you're used to. And so, you know, right now it's going to be really, really critical for you to, um, to get involved in that planning. There's really no time to wait. I kind of hit this slide and already emphasized the parts that I love about it, that we get to be at the table and we get to talk to some new people about how cool CTE is and what a big difference it makes for students. So um, that's part of the cool opportunities that we've got coming up. Um, I can't emphasize enough the need for you all to work together and to find your allies and partners that are doing similar but also different work. So making sure you know who the district leadership team is, there's an ESD liaison that is at your ESD that's assigned to help with this work. There's district CTE leadership that many of you are that person. The CTE regional coordinator can also help. Your post-secondary CTE leaders and instructors should be your allies as well to help you kind of think through this process and be part of the planning process. I think you all know what the regional coordinator's roles are. Um, you don't necessarily directly work with them on an ongoing basis, but they do support you with your reserve grant and can also be tapped on for some of these other things, kind of depending on your local situation. So some of the things that we've thought of that you might want to find out in order to be prepared is, who is on your district leadership team for this integrated application? I know Liz sits right in the middle of her team, but I know there's other people that I've run across that say, I don't even know who my team is and how do I find out? So make sure you know who's on your district leadership team and is there a CTE represented on that team? And if not, how can you help inform the team? Like they might not want CTE specifically sitting on the team, but they might want your information, right? Because it's part of, I mean, you saw where those questions are, right? They're gonna have to think about CTE. So how can you be of service and help? So ask these questions now. What engagement strategies might you recommend to help engage all of those required partners. You guys are experts at engaging industry and business. What we heard from the teams that went out and did the, um, the road show basically around engagement was, we don't know who those people are, or how to get up with the workforce and you know, investment people. We don't know who our workforce development partners are in some cases. Uh, we don't have any employers in our region, You know, whatever it might be, you're experts at that. So what strategies might you offer to help um, engage, help the people that are planning kind of think through how, how to go about this? I would encourage you to pick up the guidance again and read through and know like what are the requirements around engagement, the needs assessment, you know, and application and kind of go back and forth between Perkins and the integrated applications so that you kind of know 
kind of what the ground is, right? Like what's the, the firm ground where you're standing, but become really uh, familiar with that. This first year is gonna be um, a, a little bit rocky, I'm sure, but uh, having that knowledge in your back pocket will really help. Ari, I see that you need to run and I thank you for joining us for a while. How can you be prepared to support answering the questions? How can you prepare your CTE teachers and instructors to be part of the process? So they've been really good about advocating for their CTE programs. And I don't know about you, but perhaps some of the CTE teachers that I worked with were really like advocates for their thing, right? And sometimes you get them in a room and that's all they wanna talk about is welding, you know, or whatever it might be. And they're going to go into a situation where potentially they're with the early literacy advocate and they're with the person that's there for the arts. And how will you prepare them to be good partners, right? Listeners, speakers, you know, active, you know, what, what kinds of things can you help so that um, they, other people, you know, don't go in and like alienate people right off the bat, just speaking real frankly. So, you know, helping them to think about that engagement process. And finally, how can you leverage your post-secondary partners to help tell the CTE stories? So those are some things that I just offer to think about. Some of the things I think that you could prepare now, and maybe again with the assistance of those people that I called out as partners, is like what programs of study do you currently have? And how are they aligned between your high school and opportunities at the community college or higher ed or workforce? Um, what are articulation options? Um, there's a lot of questions in the integrated application and needs assessment around what kinds of college credits are being earned at the high school level. So knowing that information about your CTE programs would be super helpful. Um, alignment to industry standards and economic need and those college roadmaps and how students and families can understand those. I mean, having those available will be like gold, right? For people that aren't familiar with CTE to, to be able to show them visually how, how those roadmaps work. And then the other thing, blah, 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 is to look at the data, um, have some of this prepared, like start working on it now so that it's not just like in August, you're running, 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 trying to find it. But look at by school program, by college, look at your CTE participant, you know, that Explorer dashboard that we have and start kind of teasing out those gaps and disparities. There's a, you know, a lot of specific examination of the focal student groups um, of participation um, in different programs, what those gaps and barriers might be. And we all know the CTE Perkins performance data from this last uh, reporting cycle is really sketchy because of the pandemic, new indicators, all kinds of stuff, right? And so we know that there's not a lot of stock that you can place in those indicators at this point in time, but they are kind of like a piece of information. There's a couple that you might be able to use, maybe the, the work-based learning, maybe a couple of those indicators that you could look at and, and have those at least as learning points for people. And I guess finally, just kind of be on the lookout for all kinds of guidance and tools are in development. I know the team that's in EII is working really hard on guidance for that engagement, reaching out to people that may or may not feel super comfortable engaging at school and um, different types of surveys and things. So be on the lookout for guidance and tools, meetings, trainings, all of that kind of stuff and just participate as much as you can so that you're as informed as you can be. And then finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there is an hour next week kind of set aside if you'd like to drop in, if you think about this and have some questions and wanna drop in and just chat some more about it, I am, will be available during that time. And I think you know who the, the people are to go to, um, but we're listed there. Um, I'm kind of a, for those of you who haven't worked with me very much, I am kind of a project manager. I've been around CTE for a long time and I am retired. And so I'm just helping with some special projects, but I've been the liaison between 
the EII, the other five initiatives and CTE. And so kind of helping to build the processes. Janelle is our state director. Melinda is the Perkins coordinator and then Reynolds does all things fiscal. So all of that being said, do you have any questions or comments? Hi, Donna, this is Roger. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. I should have asked this earlier, but I was hoping I'd figure it out and I just couldn't figure it out. But on one of the slides you had, it said the focus, I think it said of 2023, 85% of the budget towards uh, like planning. Can you explain that a little bit more? I didn't quite follow. Right. That. So I'll see if I can find it. But basically what we're asking you, people are, you know, if we're going to have to do a two-year budget and we're going to have to start working on it like in November. How are we supposed to know like how much we're going to have when we don't typically get our allocation planning allotment until like April, May sometimes. And so we're going to go ahead and name it up front to count on 85% of your 22-23 allocation for planning purposes. So just use that for your 23-24 and 24-25 planning budget. And that will give us some wiggle room. And that's where the tiered part comes in. Right. Because if that's it's higher, then we would go to the next things on the last on the list. And if it was less, then we would we would prioritize and cut things up. That makes perfect sense. Got okay. it. All right, good. So the budget we'll submit that Reynolds will go over will be just for the 85%. Or will we submit a whole bigger budget that's tiered and we mark where the 85% is? So the document that is the, the budget template, you can go and look at the sample one on the web page for the integrated guidance if you want to. Um, it's really complicated for you all because all of the programs are integrated on one sheet. So like for each activity, there's like a line and you, you identify like which funding source it comes from. Like we're gonna commingle high school success funds and Perkins funds for this particular activity, right? So it's very complicated, but there's a tab for 23-24, there's a tab for 24-25, and then there's a tab for tiered. So those leftover things that you want to get approved ahead of time go on that third tab. And of course, there's going to be a lot of like professional development coming up on how to do that because, you know, of course, our bookkeeping people are a little concerned about like how to keep all that straight. It's all on one sheet. Um, but then what, the nice thing is, is I don't know if you've seen the dashboard that they use for the SIA grants yet, or the um, yeah SIA. They have like a dashboard that's really cool. And once you submit your application, all that information goes to the dashboard, and you can easily kind of see where you are on each of the activities and your budget. So it's kind of a, a really nice enhancement that I think you all will really like. All right, you're thinking, thinking. Liz, I have to chuckle, like you could put your coat on, you got a blanket, you got your earmuffs. The uh, Gresham Barlow School District office is an ice box. And I am in a particularly, my office is in a particularly cold corner. It's a very weird shape. I have this odd triangle office that like sucks all of the cold air. And so, yeah, in the middle of summer, I always keep a blanket here and my biggest puffiest coat because I will need it year round. Yeah. Yeah, fun. I also have my fuzzy blanket because of the air conditioning, right? When you sit for a long period of time, the air conditioner just kills me. Oh, to need air conditioning. I like, what are we, June? So yesterday, June 14th, my house was 62 degrees and we were like, we we have to turn on the heat. This is ridiculous. I've never turned on heat in June, never, but we had to. 
And if it weren't for the little kids, I might not have because I'm so stubborn. But the poor little kiddos, they were freezing. <laughs> oh, man, climate troubles. Any other questions or anything I can do for you around this? Hal, I know I have some things to do for you in the, in the information system. That's next up on my list. Liz, Thanks, what Donna. I was just going to say, I, I'm still in a processing place as how this rolls out. And especially the, like putting everything in one budget and what that's going to look like because Perkins is so like you budget every line item. Whereas like measure 98, you budget more for like a, a, a goal and or an activity, but there's going to be multiple line items there. So it's just wrapping my head around how that works and like fitting together a budget for $150,000 and then ones that are multi-million dollar budgets is kind of a weird thing. I agree with you and I'm wondering like on the practice I can see how the how it's supposed to work and I'm working with the group that's developing the template and the guidance and the learning that's supposed to go around that. And it's definitely apples and oranges kind of with the things that we're doing. Um, but I know that there's training coming up. And so just stay tuned for that um, as they come out with it. They're waiting because they want people to really focus on the idea of engagement, right? Like don't start with the money, start with the engagement and the needs and then put the money to what you identify. So they're purposefully kind of like slow walking that while we're developing the resources around the engagement. So, but I, I hear yeah. you. And that, that's also kind of hard for some of us because like we, we've been doing engagement all along, tons of like a really high quality where we're getting like on the, the scale, really hitting some good force. And um, so we're ready to continue to move and make sure that we're, um, doing everything that we, we should be doing. And uh, cause we're always in that constant like engagement, make adjustments, feedback, engagement sort of cycle. And I think Hal, Hal's probably in kind of the, a similar boat, just what I know about how he's got things going on down there. So it's hard to not look ahead and want to be prepared as much as possible. Well, I'm wondering Liz and Hal, if uh, your ESD liaison uh, or your ODE regional rep person, if, if you were to reach out to them, if they might be able to like share early with you some of the, the thinking and findings around the budget, um, if your readiness level is at the point where you're ready to move into that, um, that might be a conversation to have with them. Hi, Bianca, thanks for joining. Hi, good to be here. We're kind of done into that whole question section, but we're recording it so you can go back and catch it. Oh, perfect. That's, uh, that's what I was wondering. I'm finishing up a different position. So I'll start this new position in about a week. Wow. And what district are you in? Beaverton. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, it looks like people are getting ready to go, and I know you all are very busy. Uh, there are office hours next week if you'd like to drop in. If you think of anything, please feel free to reach out. And we'll probably have the recording available by Monday is what we're shooting for. Okay. Thank you again. I really appreciate you all and all the work you Thank do. You, Thank, Thank you, Donna. Thanks, Donna. Take care of you guys. Yes, yeah. you as well have. Donna, bring Bye -bye. me some of that warmth. <laughs> Come on down and sit by the pool. You know you'll love it. Come on, bring the kids. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh man, that'd be great. All right, have a good rest of your week. All right, you too. Bye bye.